Hello and welcome to our final video on the Baroque period. We are going to be covering chapters 11 through 15 in this video of your textbook and as always it's highly suggested that you utilize the study guides provided on Blackboard. We're going to use the study guide to kind of guide our conversation through this lecture video so you may want to have yours pulled up as well. Alright, so we're going to start off with chapter 11 and we're going to talk about one of the most important composers of the Baroque period, Johann Sebastian Bach. Now Bach is a pretty big figure in Baroque music. Uh, last time we talked about three of the minor composers who were Monteverdi, Vivaldi, and Purcell, but the one of the big two that we're going to talk about uh, this time is Bach. Now I will start off by saying that a lot of times when you're talking about Bach you want to specify which Bach you're talking about because Bach as you read in your textbook you will discover that he actually came from a family of musicians and specifically four of his sons that you see here went on to be fairly famous composers during the classical period which is the next period of course. Um, so if in the textbook we're not going to cover these guys here but in, out there in the world you may hear of other box and I want you to be familiar who those are. So a lot of times when you see box name we usually just go by the last name of a composer but with Johann Sebastian Bach, we usually put J.S. Bach or Johann Sebastian Bach so we know which Bach we're talking about. Okay, so let's look at our first question here about Bach. What nationality was Bach? Well, you can see here he was born in Germany. So he is a German composer. As a matter of fact, um, Handel is also a uh, German composer. And um, unlike Bach, though, Handel left Germany and spent nearly the last 50 years of his life in England, where he was buried, actually in Westminster Abbey. So... Bach, on the other hand, lived and worked his entire life in Germany. He was not as well-traveled as Handel was. All right, so looking on to the next question, what condition did Bach suffer from later in life? And it turns out Handel actually suffered from this too. His eyesight deteriorated, and the year of his death in 1750, he was actually blind. So even though he was losing his eyesight, uh, he continued to work all the way up until the year of his death where he pretty much was um, forced not to you know do much because you know as an organist you can't really play a whole lot when you're blind um, and he couldn't uh, you know write music and stuff and plus he, he was pretty old by then so he uh, had to take a break from his activities but um, moving on to the next question on which instrument was Bach famous for being a virtuoso again a virtuoso we encountered that term with uh, Vivaldi uh, virtuoso is someone who can just dazzle audiences with their proficiency on an instrument so we're not just talking about someone who's good on an instrument someone who is really the cream of the crop and so Bach was a master organist that's the answer to this one here and of course that goes for any keyboard instrument like harpsichord. Bach uh, was a very gifted uh, keyboardist and um, organist and he could even improvise fugues and stuff like that. All right, number four, although Bach was a master of broke composition, he never composed a, and actually if you know the answer, that should be an A, a N there, an N, because the word starts with a vowel. And you will read down here that he um, was a master of composition, but he never composed an opera. Now, believe it or not, he incorporated a lot of operatic elements and was definitely familiar with operas. Um, he probably attended some because he displayed a knowledge of operatic techniques in some of his cantatas. His cantatas, by the way, we're going to learn about in a chapter coming up when we have a chapter on the cantata, was uh, basically a musical service for the churches in which he wrote music for. And uh, the position that he had um, for the last part of his life, and the one that he held the longest, was uh, being composer for St. Thomas Church in Leipzig in Germany. And when he worked there, he often... Uh, would write cantatas for holidays and, and other events at the church. And these cantatas featured 
practically arias and recitatives and things like this that you would normally find in an opera. But of course, they weren't in an opera. They were inside the church cantatas. All right, uh, his death in 1750 marks the end of the Baroque period. It's the answer to that. That's actually covered in chapter one, but I did want you to know it for uh, the chapter on Bach. Um, his death in 1750 marks the end of the Baroque. Now, Handel ends up outliving him, uh, I believe, nine more years to 1759. So Handel's going to outlive him by a few years, but they were both born in the same year and the same country. So both Bach and Handel were born in 1685, in Germany. So they share a lot of similarities, but also when we get to Handel, you're going to see Handel had some things that he did not have in common with Bach. As far as we know, we're not sure the two ever met. We know that they uh, planned on meeting on a couple occasions, but um, it's a shame that the two master giants of Baroque composition, uh, as far as we know, we have no substantial proof that they ever met in real world. It's possible they did and we just don't have documentation of it, but as far as we know they, they never did. Alright, so we are going to move on now to the next chapter. Um, oh, before I do, um, I do want to include some information about Bach that's not covered in your quiz, just some things to kind of FYI stuff to get you a feel for what his life was like. Um, he did work previously before going to Leipzig at Curtin. Uh, Curtin is the way you pronounce that there with the funny accent on it. Um, and he worked for a prestigious uh, prince there and got it. You know, it was a pretty good secular position he had. So Bach wrote secular music too. Don't think he just wrote religious um, music for the churches there. He, You also will read that he um, taught a boys school there and taught them music. He also on every Friday night um, at the local coffee house he would organize with some students um, a concert every Friday night. So they had a little Friday night jam session there in Leipzig and on top of that he also fathered 20 children by two different wives. His first wife died and his second wife who he married actually was a soprano in his choir. Uh, between the two he fathered 20 children however nine of them uh, were the ones that outlived him so he buried 11 of his 20 children and uh, yeah, that was actually uh, pretty common back then for people to have lots of children because of that very fact that a lot of them didn't make it into adulthood. A lot of children died in their first two years um, because that's when they're the most vulnerable and of course they didn't have the sanitation that we have today and medicine and things like this. And so any kind of complication with child uh, and sometimes mothers and in, in, in giving birth could be deadly. But it was just a fact of life at the time. So um, he also was, you see here, a very religious man. He wasn't writing for the church just because it was a paycheck. Um, and you can really hear it in his religious music. It sounds like it's got really good heart and soul. It, it's not just um, frivolous you know, church music. You also see here he was a master of improvisation, which is creating music at the same time it's being performed. You're playing it on the spot. So if Bach were alive in the 20th century, I'm pretty sure he would have loved jazz, because you do a lot of that in jazz as well. You will note that in the book it mentions that in his own lifetime he was revered more as a master organist. Uh, even sometimes organ companies would get him to test out their prototypes and give suggestions and stuff. Um, he wasn't renowned as a composer and his music actually was not performed that much after his death, not until the early 1800s. And there's another composer that we'll get to later in the semester by the name of Felix Mendelssohn, another German composer. And he actually presented Bach's St. Matthew Passion. And that's one of his church pieces. And it created a great interest in Bach's music. And ever since Felix Mendelssohn, Bach has been a staple guy to perform at music concerts. All right, so that's just a little FYI stuff. Uh, we're going to move on to Chapter 12 now, which is on the Baroque Suite. And again, uh, this class, we're, we're kind of just a survey class, and even though there's a lot of information in this chapter, I really only have one question I want you to know. I just want you to know what a Baroque Suite is. Anytime you see the word suite, uh, whether it be a Baroque piece or even a piece written later, 
Uh, for instance, you probably have heard of the Nutcracker Suite. Well, when we get to the Nutcracker, you're going to know that it's a piece of ballet music. However, if you hear someone say they're going to a concert and it's the Nutcracker Suite and not the Nutcracker, the Nutcracker is the ballet. That means you're going to see people dancing while the orchestra plays the music. If it's the Nutcracker Suite, then it's just the music from the ballet. You don't expect to see any dancers if you go see the Nutcracker Suite. And that gives us a hint as to what a suite is. It's instrumental pieces of music that are closely linked with dancing. And since ballet, of course, is a form of dance, a lot of times if you take the ballet music and you just play it in concert form, then you would call it a suite. However, in the Baroque period, well, usually when you say suite, it is a collection of popular dance forms. And you can see here that it's usually, uh, a lot of times, uh, multinational. Uh, Bach has in, in this suite here examples from three different countries. All right, so um, the suite example you have here is an orchestral suite. That means it's played by the orchestra, and uh, it's the third one that he wrote in D major. You can see the dates in which he wrote it, and you have uh, the different movements here. We discussed movement previously, but what I did is I went online and I found a scan of a performance um, uh, program from the University of North Texas College of Music. And you can see here that someone is playing a cello suite here by Bach. And you'll notice that the Roman numerals mark the different movements. Keep in mind that when someone plays something that is divided into movements like this, you hold your applause until the very end of all the movements. So if you ever find yourself in a concert and you see that they're playing uh, something like Bach's Orchestral Suite or something like this, notice for it, it will be divided into movements. And sometimes the movements are named after the form that they are, like an overture here or an air. And actually, this is a bit of a mistranslation here. It is translated from German to English as air. But if you translate it into Italian, guess what you get? Aria. And that's basically an aria on the G string uh, there. That's often called air on the G string. And it's, no, it's not talking about the garment, the undergarment. It's talking about the G string on the violin. And when you listen to this piece, uh, which is part of your required listening this week, uh, you will notice that the violin plays a solo there. And then you have here a gavotte, a bore, a jig. A jig uh, basically is, if you have ever heard someone dance in a jig, that's what the German word for that is. So uh, you have various different kinds of uh, movements here. Sometimes they are named after the form, as Bach tended to do with his uh, orchestral suite number three here. Other times uh, you may see them named after um, the tempo. Uh, like we see here for this sonata here, um, where, you know, Vivace, which you remember is very fast and lively. Sometimes the movements um, are called by, you know, just Allegro or something like that. But because in the Baroque period, many of the uh, suites were based on specific dance forms, a lot of times they would use uh, the form as the name of the composition. You can see that... Um, some of the uh, common forms used in these dances and you actually see some of the same structures or similar structures in modern day pop songs. Uh, for instance, here we have AABA, which is very similar to the sectional verse chorus that you find in a lot of like Broadway songs and stuff like that, which are actually AABA. All right, so that's basically all you need to know about the suite. A suite is a collection of instrumental pieces that are taken from dancing. Okay, uh, and we'll move on now to chapter 13, which is on the chorale in the church cantata. And before we get into this one too much, I do advise at this point that you go and pull up the video, and it may be posted um, differently when you go into Blackboard than what you see in this video, because I may re end up reposting it into your weekly assignments for this week, because uh, I haven't yet made those available to you. Um, I do have an older video I made on my other YouTube channel that is um, that explains the chorale and the cantata, so be on the lookout for that. It will also be required viewing, 
And so that's going to do a lot to explain this chapter and I don't want to give you too much repetition. So we're going to stick to these questions here. It's not going to do it total justice and it's not going to illustrate it very well but if you watch that video it will do a much better job. So at the end of these four questions if you're still very confused about what a corral and a church cantata is check out the video. Okay. I think it does a very good job of um, explaining it and it's under two minutes long so hey you can't beat that. Alright number one what is a corral? A corral was a type of hymn that was sung in Lutheran churches, especially during the Baroque period. They sound very much like hymns. And if you haven't heard what a hymn sounds like, maybe you weren't raised in a Christian church, then you are welcome to go on YouTube and search for some common hymns like Amazing Grace or... Um, you know, at the cross, or I'm trying to think of some, and of course I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, Amazing Grace has to be probably the most famous uh, Christian hymn of all time. Um, so look that one up, and you'll get a sense of what Christian hymns sound like. Or A Mighty Fortress is Our God is actually one that was written by Martin Luther that Bach later uh, incorporated into a piece. He did basically an arrangement of it. Um, now, the particular cantata that you have as an example is Wacket auf, ruft uns die Stimme, and I am probably butchering that, but if I recall, that is the way it's pronounced. Um, I don't speak German a lot, but I have picked up a little bit from studying music, and I believe that's how you pronounce it. Don't worry about the pronunciation, though, because I'm obviously not going to um, <laughs> quiz you on that. Now, the translation there basically is provided for you in your textbook and everything, and you can see that um, it, there's only a few movements of this included. And uh, what I want to do for you is just play you just a little bit of the seventh movement. Um, because that is the one that has, oh, I hit the wrong thing there. That is the one that has uh, the part that sounds the most like a hymn. And uh, hopefully it'll pull up here. It may not let me, it may have timed out actually. Um, maybe I've been on this page too long. But um, just, just go and listen to the seventh movement of this um, this, I, yeah, I'm not sure why it's not pulling up. That's weird. Um, so, yeah, it might have timed out or, or some kind of computer glitch or something. Uh, such is the case with computers sometimes. But if you listen to this one, it sounds very hymn-like, but you will notice at the end of every musical phrase, they do pause briefly. It sounds like the music kind of stops and pauses for a second, and that's pretty typical of um, German chorales. So they're, they're hymn-like uh, things. They're usually in German, obviously, uh, especially Bach's, because um, Lutheranism was most popular in Germany there at the time. Um, cantatas were, again, like musical sermons. This uh, one by Bach in your textbook is an example of a cantata. Nowadays, you still hear of churches putting on cantatas, usually around Easter and Christmas. But there were many other holy days um, uh, in the church calendar that, that Bach would write cantatas for. And um, he wrote a lot of these. Um, there's quite a few of them. And um, he would incorporate um, various movements in each of these. So cor chorales uh, were one of the common choices for movements within the cantata. Now you see that you have a few movements here. Uh, we're not going to you know, make you listen to the whole thing, but one of your required listenings uh, sections for um, this week will in require you to listen to some of the movements from this cantata. And so that'll give you a good feel for it. And, um, you know, these definitions can be fleshed out from in your textbook. If, I've, if, if I'm kind of losing you a little bit, uh, just, you know, find the definitions in your text. Um, and, of course, in the video, it defines it even better. Uh, were cantatas part of a religious service? Um, and the reason I asked this question is because we're also going to ask a very similar question of the oratorios. You see that question's there. 
Now, cantatas were part of a religious service. People would go to church, and they would be inside a church, and they would see the cantatas and hear them. Oratorios, we're going to find out, even though in the Baroque period, oratorios were religious in nature. They took their stories from the Bible. They were not usually performed in a church. They were usually performed in a concert hall. And we're going to see why that is when we get to it. Okay? Who sang the soprano and alto parts in Bach's church choir, which was common at the time? Now, you may recall that I mentioned that Bach married a soprano in his choir. Um, sometimes women were allowed to sing um, professionally at this time. It really depended on what, where in Europe you were. In Italy, it was not as encouraged as much in some other parts of Europe. But um, if you look in your textbook, you will see that it was actually young boys that mainly sang the soprano and alto parts. So modern performances of box music, you're going to have women sing the uh, soprano and alto parts more than likely because the practice of training young boys to sing in church is something that only very few churches do nowadays. So, and, you know, the ideas of women, you know, leading in church and stuff like that. I mean, we have women preachers now, so obviously there's not the... Um, discrimination against women and church music that there used to be. But that is the answer to that question there. And this was pretty common even in the Baroque period. By the time we get to the classical period though, especially with uh, opera um, and uh, some of the religious music, um, by the time you get to the classical period there is um, quite a shift in that. And you will see in the classical period that women were staples uh, in the opera, especially by the late classical period. All right, so um, moving on to chapter 14, we deal with the oratorio. The oratorio, it doesn't have a huge section on it. There's just a few paragraphs. The oratorio it can be summed up in another video. And again, I'll probably repost this into your weekly assignment section here. Um, the oratorio and opera are um, very similar when you're listening because when you're listening you don't see what the performers look like obviously so if you're listening to say a recording and you're not watching a YouTube video that's a live performance or something like that it may be kind of difficult to tell an opera from an oratorio especially if it's in a language that you don't understand now, if it's in a language that you understand, then it may be easier to tell them apart. I have here a picture of a performance of Handel's Messiah, which is the most famous and probably most performed oratorio in the world. And you will notice that this does not look much like an opera because you do not have costumes, you do not have scenery, these people are not acting out their parts, they're all dressed either, I've seen them wear choir robes or either wearing tuxes and dresses as you see here. You do have your soloists up front, you do have your orchestra here, you do have your chorus singers here, and therefore if you're just listening and you can't see all of this, it may be confusing as to whether or not you're listening to an opera or an oratorio. As a matter of fact, I've made some of the movements from Handel's Messiah, and you'll actually find those movements talked about in the listening guides for that in chapter 15, because your main example for Handel is the Messiah. I'm um, sorry, it's just called Messiah. There is no the in front of it, although sometimes you do see people call it that. Um, but Messiah was um, is actually covered in chapter 15, which is your chapter on Handel. So make sure that you, if you want to listen to examples of oratorio, you have to go to the next chapter. But when you listen to uh, the sections I've assigned from the Messiah, or just Messiah, um, then you will notice that it does sound a lot like opera. You have uh, this piece, Every Valley uh, Shall Be Exalted, which is actually a solo piece um, so it's very much like an aria because you have the orchestra that comes in and plays and then you have a solo voice singing. So it has a lot of the similarities with an opera aria, or an opera aria, but it's not an opera aria because 
the guy, if you were watching the performance, which you will see in this video, I do show live performances so you can see the differences. You'll notice this is a gentleman like this, wearing a tuck, standing up and singing. He's not acting out the part. He's not holding props in his hand. He's not wearing a costume. There's no scenery up on stage. And you will also notice, if you pay attention to the lyrics, that this is actually taken from the Bible. Now, Baroque operas generally are about Greek drama or Greek mythology or Ro Roman or Greek history. It's, it's secular subjects. It has nothing to do with the Bible. Oratorios in the Baroque period, however, take their source material from the Bible. So think of an oratorio as a almost opera, but without scenery, without costumes, without props, and that kind of thing, without actors acting the parts out. It's going to look like this. It's sort of like an opera in its musical structure, though, and its subject matter will be from the Bible. Now, later on in the later periods of music, there are religious operas, and then there's secular oratorios. But specifically in the Baroque period, almost every one that you find, the operas are going to be secular. They're going to probably be taken from Greek mythology. And the oratorios are going to be from the Bible. Okay? So the question here, what is an oratorio, an oratorio and so forth, um, we've sort of answered that. So were oratorios meant to be part of a religious service? We've pretty much answered that. Oratorios are usually performed in a concert hall like this. Uh, sometimes they involved uh, a, a few churches coming together to perform them. Sometimes they were professional musicians um, that were just um, performing them, and they were not necessarily aligned with any specific church. So that's why oratorios traditionally are not performed in churches. Although today, in modern day uh, setting, you will either go see an oratorio performed by, say, a college group like this, or you may see it performed in a church. And sometimes just parts of Messiah are performed uh, in a church. I know I, w I was at a church one time in high school, and it was a Baptist church, and they around Christmas time they did just a few selections like the hallelujah chorus from the from Messiah but they didn't perform the whole thing okay so a few questions about Handel and then we're done uh, what nationality was Handel if you recall he was born the same year 1685 as Bach and also in the same country although not the same city uh, he, he was so if you're gonna answer this question uh, it's German now this can be a bit of a problem because the British pretty much adopt Handel later on. He's actually going to get himself in trouble with the um, the Elector of Hanover, who was his employer in Germany. He asked for a leave to go to London and go play his opera there and while in London he was a huge success. He got showered with praise and gifts and he wanted some more, so he asked for another leave, and his um, his aristocratic employer said, yeah, I'll, give, I'll let you go again for a, quote, reasonable time was part of the contract, and, uh, well, Handel just never came back, and so that is something that uh, caught him in hot water, and it actually came back later to uh, bite him in the butt, um, so... We are going to uh, move on to the next question here. Um, what profession did Handel's father want him to study? He actually wanted him to study, if you see here, he wanted him to study law. He didn't want him to become a musician. He was not from a family of musicians like Bach was. And being a musician back then, I know we, we talk about these guys and we study them and we hold them up in high esteem. But just as today, you know, think about when kids tell their parents, hey, I want to be a musician. I want to be, you know, the next big rapper or the next big pop star. I mean, there's there's just so many people that don't make a good living that try to do that, you know. Um, and in the Baroque period, you know, you servants were the composers and musicians. They were not people of stature. They were not uh, part of the rising middle class for the most part. Now, we are going to see Handel did... Uh, went above and beyond is what most composers were capable of doing at that time and he actually ran his own opera house at one point so um, 
you can see here by his portrait, he definitely was a lot more financially successful than Bach. I mean, even the piece of paper he's holding is bigger than that little pathetic little piece of paper that Bach's holding. If we go back to chapter 11 here, I mean, you almost feel sorry for Bach. It looks like he, and you know, Bach doesn't have the big wig and he doesn't have elaborate clothing. But if you look at uh, Handel here, now Handel never married, never had 20 kids and stuff and you know uh, wrote an opera you could you could make a lot more money in opera than you could write in church music so you can see um, however there were sometimes greater risk because Han Handel actually went bankrupt at one point and had a breakdown but he was be able to able to bounce back and um, and actually after that I uh, wrote the Messiah and became pretty well known for writing uh, these big oratorios later in life all right, so it says note, as indicated in chapter two, most musicians and composers in the Baroque period became so because they were from a family of musicians or composers. Handel is unique in this area. Okay. What country did Handel relocate to and live almost 50 years until his death? I've already spilled the beans on that one, but in case you missed it, England. He relocated to England and um, wasn't supposed to uh, relocate there uh, permanently, but he disobeyed his aristocratic master and stayed there. Why? Because they treated him like practically royalty there himself. Uh, Handel's, as a matter of fact, Queen Anne, uh, he was like her, her favorite composer. And that was a good way, man, if you could get a king or a queen that just adored your music, whew, man, you, had, you were set then. All right, Handel's music changes blank more than box. And so if you read in your textbook, you will know one of the things we said about Bach is that he was a master of counterpoint, and that meant polyphonic music. Handel's, Handel's music changes texture more than box, and you will see that definitely in the Hallelujah Chorus. You'll hear passages where it's monophonic, and then it goes to polyphonic, and then it goes to homophonic, and very much like the piece of music that we listened to back in chapter 8 of part 1 that had the shifts in texture, you will see that sometimes with Handel's music. Handel's tended to prefer homophonic texture. The British people tended to prefer homophonic music over the polyphony that you see in continental Europe. So Handel's music, that's probably one of the reasons why it has more homophonic texture to it, um, because he spent nearly 50 years of, at the end of his life in England itself, and that's where he wrote some of his most famous music. Which one of Handel's oratorios is perhaps the most well-known of all time? And that would be Messiah, of course. We've already sort of answered that one already. How long did it take Handel to, to compose the Messiah? Okay, um, you'll see in your textbook it only took him 24 days. And that might not seem much to you, but keep in mind that it usually took composers months and sometimes years to write an oratorio. And as a matter of fact, Messiah is so big it actually comes in two parts. Um, as a matter of fact, next time it, you see you see a poster advertising like Handel's Messiah performed at a college or something like that. If you ever get a chance to go, you may want to check out the program and see if they're just doing one of the parts, which is kind of common, or if they're doing the entire thing. It's quite popular, especially with modern audiences, to just do one part or another part. And I'm, and I'm sorry, I was uh, confused here. There's three parts because it deals with the entire life and ministry and death and resurrection and stuff like that of Christ. So that's why it's called Messiah. So there are three parts. And of course, the um, parts one and two here are where we get sections in your textbook. But like I said, usually in modern day performances, they either take selections from the various parts and do a condensed version of it. Uh, and every once in a while, you'll see a group do the entire thing. Okay. So 24 days, I mean, considering this is written for full orchestra, vocal soloist, and full choir, and Handel wrote all that out in 24 days. Uh, he practically locked himself in his room and just wrote nonstop. He even told a friend of his he felt like he was dictating from heaven itself. Um, and by the way, if you ever find yourself at a performance of the most famous selection from Messiah, which is the Hallelujah Chorus. 
The Hallelujah Chorus, when it was first performed, and it was actually performed in Ireland, when it was first performed, the King of England stood up out of the majesty of it and recognizing that God is omnipotent, that he is, uh, he even reigns over the king. So out of respect for this, he stood up. And to this day, it is customary for people to stand up whenever the Hallelujah Chorus is performed. Uh, I encourage you to go on YouTube. One of the things um, I really like on YouTube sometimes to watch is flash mobs. And there is a fantastic video of uh, a few Christmases ago where a one of these flash mob, mob groups, they went into a mall and they secretly planted people in the food court at the mall. And you have a lady that's playing a little electric keyboard set on like an organ sound. And she is playing Christmas music and everybody's all jolly listen to the Christmas music. And then she begins to play the Hallelujah Chorus. And suddenly, out of nowhere, a lady starts to sing, this lady right here. So I'm going to play a little bit of this for you just so you can hear it. And I encourage you to listen to the whole thing. It's amazing to see how people all around the food court just immediately stop everything they're doing. And their jaws are almost on the floor listening to the beauty. And they, of course, they're a bit confused at first. They're not sure what's going on. But once they figure out that this has been obviously staged and everything, it's amazing how how much appreciation they show for it and, and just awed by the beauty of it. This is one of my favorite flash mob videos of all time. So we're going to fast forward it here a little bit and you can see that eventually there's tons of people joining in on this and uh, listen for the changes of texture that we talked about. You'll notice it goes between that homophonic texture to polyphonic to monophonic and that's pretty typical of Handel's music. So watch the whole thing on your own. It's a pretty entertaining video. Um, you should be able to just put in um, Flash Mob Hallelujah Chorus and it should be the first thing that pops up. So um, that is an example of probably the most famous piece from Messiah. And again, if you do hear this performed in public, it's pretty customary to stand up. Um, I was at a Christmas concert one time and they actually closed out the concert with just the Hallelujah Chorus. They didn't do all of Messiah, they just did the Hallelujah Chorus. And it was, it was pretty neat because almost everybody at the concert knew to stand up. And the ones that even didn't know, they kind of figured it out. But if you ever want to know why people stand up, it's because uh, you know, it's, it's, some, it's a precedent that the King of England started way back in the day. Okay, so that is the end. Uh, that's everything you really need to know specifically for the quiz. Um, again, there's some of the information that I didn't really go over very much uh, because it's included in these two videos that you should also check out and consider those to be part of your required viewing for this week. But I promise you they're quick and rather painless. This one's less than two minutes long. This one is right under four minutes long. So it won't take too much of your time and you are encouraged to watch them as many times as you need to to understand those concepts.
Also, one last final thing. There is a note up here. Please make sure you recognize that. Uh, there haven't been any listening questions so far on your broke quizzes, but this week's quiz, um, or I'm not sure if it's going to be included in this week's assignments, but the one that is on chapters 11 through 15 of the broke period, that quiz will have five listening questions. And these questions cover the entirety of baroque forms. For instance, the fugue was covered way back in chapter 4. The concerto grosso was covered way back in chapter 3. They are fair game to be put on this quiz, even though they're not in chapters 11 through 15. So please go back and review the Baroque forms. Um, those should be chapter 3, the Concerto Grosso, chapter 4, the Fugue, and then all, any of the others um, that you see. Anything that talks about a form, such as uh, obviously the ones we covered this time, um, like cantatas and chorales and opera and oratorio and stuff like that. All of those are fair game. Uh, so we've spelled it out for you right there. Those are the five specifically. You really need to know what they sound like. And if you can't distinguish a fugue from a chorale, then you're in trouble. That means you need to go back and review um, the videos that we have, the lecture videos, as well as these videos in the Baroque period folder that explain uh, each of those individual ones there. Okay, um, so that does it for this uh, lecture video. We are at about 41 minutes, a little over 41 minutes, so this one's uh, a little bit shorter and than our usual video length of about an hour, but again, use the extra time to check out the videos on the Corral and Cantata and the Oratorio and Opera. And we will see you next week.